Nestled in the small English village of Blacknest in Hampshire lies a quaint, almost stereotypical British pub known as the Jolly Farmer. Surrounded by lush green fields and sleepy country lanes, the pub seems pretty unremarkable. But those old enough to remember know that the town has a dark and mysterious past. And in the run-up to Christmas of 1989, the mood in Blacknest was anything but subdued. The night of February 4th of 1989 was much like any other for the staff and customers of the Jolly Farmer. The pub filled with its regular faces, propping up the bar until around 2 o'clock in the morning when last orders were finally called. After the last of the drunken customers had been corralled out of the pub, the only two people that remained were the manager, Richard Dean, and second chef, Clifford Howes. Both men busied themselves with the last few items on their closed-down list, yet none of those activities involved picking up the pub's phone, because if they had, they'd have noticed that the line was dead, and that one little detail might have just alerted them to the horrifying fate that awaited them. Because just before 2.40am in the wee small hours of December 5th, the Jolly Farmer was rocked by a huge explosion, which ripped through the building and reduced it to rubble, with both Richard Dean and Clifford Howes still inside. The explosion is said to have been heard over two miles away, with many claiming they saw the fireball erupting into the sky. Horrified ambulance and fire crews arrived shortly afterward, only to be greeted by a huge smoking ruin that used to be the Jolly Farmer. All that remained were the pub's sign and a chimney which had somehow remained intact during the building's collapse, with debris being spread for almost a hundred yards around the explosion's epicenter. Paramedics and firefighters immediately began trawling the rubble for any survivors, and the scene quickly became like something out of a disaster movie. After one particularly large chunk of rubble was moved, rescue personnel were faced with the sight of an arm sticking out of the rubble. It was Richard Dean's, and as his saviors worked to free him from the smoking debris, they noticed that his clothes had melted onto his skin from the heat of the explosion. He would go on to miraculously survive the ordeal, but received catastrophic third-degree burns to almost a third of his body. Yet compared to Clifford House, Richard had been lucky. The second chef had been standing directly over the spot where the explosion had originated and had been crushed under tons of burning debris which had collapsed into the pub's cellar, burying and burning him alive in the process. His remains were not recovered until over 12 hours later when emergency services finally cleared enough of the debris to sufficiently reach the bottom of the pub's cellar. He was just 34 years old when he was killed. By the time emergency crews had reached the cellar and thus recovered Clifford's body, the cause of the explosion became apparent. The smell of gasoline was almost overpowering, suggesting the explosion was no accident, and when the remains of a homemade fuse were found, what remained of the Jolly Farmer officially became a crime scene. Arson investigators discovered that gasoline had been poured through the wooden doors of the pub's beer cellar, creating a pool of flammable liquid right underneath the pub, which would in turn cause flammable vapors to form, causing the explosion itself. Police also discovered that the pub's phones had stopped working because they had been professionally cut obviously to prevent any survivors from contacting emergency services. It became apparent that the pub's destruction was the result of a sophisticated and well-executed plan. But who would be vicious and devious enough to do such a thing? Almost 20 years later in 2008, pub landlord Arthur Tompkins gave an interview in which he said, There was absolutely no reason to target us. The police had theories, but they found nothing, because there was nothing to be found. It was just a quaint little pub in the middle of nowhere. Why would anybody target it? It's ridiculous. At the time of the arson attack, there were seven different pubs of the same name in the county of Hampshire alone, leading some to theorize that the attack was a simple case of mistaken identity, yet in the course of the investigation, none of the other pubs seemed to have a reason for why they might be targeted either. Naturally, the police were completely baffled, their only lead was a vehicle which appeared to be fleeing the area, but neither the car nor the identity of its driver could ever be uncovered. Despite the floundered investigation, Hampshire police have refused to give up on the case, with Chief Investigating Officer Mike Southwell stating that he's 
convinced that the murderer is still detectable. Arthur Tompkins is less confident, saying he's resigned to the fact that the identity of the fire bomber will forever remain a mystery. Yet despite the horrifying destruction that was wrought that December night, the jolly farmer rose from the ashes and is still open for business today. Who knows if the attack was the result of mistaken identity, or the result of a deranged person with a vendetta against the pub, its patrons, or those who work there. And though the UK has largely forgotten the Black Ness bombing, those who witnessed its aftermath will never forget the sight of a street strewn with rubble, debris, and blood. On the eve of their wedding day in January of 2006, the future looked bright for Bruce and Sylvia Pardo. With a combined income of over $150,000, the couple's fledgling marriage promised to be very comfortable, and they had recently purchased a half a million dollar home in Montrose, California. It was on a quiet suburban cul-de-sac, just up the hill from the Holy Redeemer Catholic Church, where Bruce volunteered as an usher at the children's mass. Bruce was making $122,000 a year as an electrical engineer at ITT Electronic Systems Radar down in Van Nuys, and together the couple built a nest egg of almost $90,000 in just two years. In his spare time, Bruce either worked on home improvements or walked Saki, the couple's big brown Akita, over at the neighborhood dog park. Yet despite their opulent and initially congenial married life, there was soon trouble in paradise. By December 2007, Sylvia was sleeping in the spare bedroom while spending weekends at her parents' place. Two months later, she told Bruce she wanted a divorce. Sylvia filed court papers asking for attorney's fees and $3,166 in monthly spousal support. The situation has become untenable, she wrote in one document, and continuing the marriage is not an option. Sylvia also claimed her husband had drawn down their 88,500 savings to 17,000 in just two months and was transferring funds to a private account in an attempt to withhold capital from her. This attempt was identified and stopped by Sylvia's attorneys and the results were disastrous for Bruce. As a result of his malpractice, Bruce lost his job at ITT and soon was drowning in debt while struggling to find work. He begged the court to grant him spousal support until he could find employment, complaining that his former employer had failed to provide him with a severance package and that he was losing $2,000 a month in expenses. Yet instead of granting his request, the court ordered Pardo to pay his ex-wife $1,785 a month in spousal support plus $3,570 for past payments. When the divorce was settled, he was also ordered to pay his ex-wife an additional $10,000 for past payments, but most painfully, he was forced to give her custody of their big brown Akita, Saki. By Christmas of 2008, Bruce was flat broke and desperate. He told a close friend that he was considering leaving California altogether and was searching for work up in Iowa of all places. He said his plan was to perform one last Christmas Eve midnight mass at his church and that he'd leave for Iowa before the holidays were through. But as it turned out, Bruce decided on a very different course of action instead. On Christmas Eve of 2008, Bruce Pardo had started drinking early. Some say he might have been in two minds regarding what he was about to do, but in reality, Bruce had been planning it for months. He'd been tinkering away at something in the garage of his home, one of the few things he'd managed to retain from what had been some pretty brutal divorce proceedings. The device had taken weeks to perfect, and he'd be darned if he wasn't going to give it a proper field test. After finishing off a bottle of vodka, Bruce walked into his bedroom and found his outfit for the evening laid out on the bed. It was a bright red Santa Claus costume, complete with black boots, bushy white beard, and most importantly, the iconic red hat. He then packed a few things in his car, climbed into the driver's seat and drove off into the night. Just before 11.30 p.m., Bruce Pardo parked up outside a large middle-class home in Covina, California. He got out of his car, grabbed a special package from the back seat, 
then made his way to the front door. From the doorstep, Bruce could hear a party of about two dozen guests was going on inside. There was laughter, the clinking of glasses, and classic Christmas songs playing on some crisp-sounding stereo system. Bruce raised his hand and knocked on the door of a house containing his ex-wife and her immediate family. Inside, an eight-year-old girl heard the knocks then excitedly rushed to the door to investigate. When she opened it, she must have been nothing short of delighted to none other than Santa Claus himself standing in the threshold. And even better, he actually had a wrapped present under his arm too. Bruce was numb from the liquor. He knew what he was about to do was vile, evil in fact. He just didn't care. He had only one thing on his mind that night, the same thing he'd fixated on for months prior. Revenge. Bruce reached into his Santa suit, pulled out a handgun, and sent a bullet tearing through the little girl's head. He then stepped over her body, burst into the living room, and began to open fire on the 24 remaining party guests. What followed was the very definition of horrifying and chaotic. Guests dove for cover, scrambling for the exits as a gunman dressed as Santa Claus continued to systematically slaughter them. Some didn't even have a chance to react, mistaking Bruce's outfit for a harmless prank and watching gormlessly before their loved ones were murdered. Others who tried to flee were clipped by Bruce's bullets, then shot execution style as they lay helpless on the floor. One girl leapt from a second floor window, breaking her ankle when she smashed into the concrete below. A total of 16 of the 25 guests managed to make it out that night, yet despite being out of live targets, Bruce wasn't done wreaking havoc. He opened the gift wrap package and took out a homemade pressurized device that would douse the interior of the house with a flammable cocktail made up of high-octane racing fuel and compressed air. Essentially, he'd built a homemade flamethrower, and he intended to use it in the incineration of all that Sylvia held dear. Thankfully, Bruce's despicable scheme went horribly wrong when the canister's vapor suddenly ignited upon release. The ensuing fire caused Bruce to suffer third-degree burns to his arms and legs, with the heat being so intense that portions of the Santa costume were melted onto his flesh. Meanwhile, party guests who had managed to escape the massacre began calling 911 to report the shootings and the fire. He's shooting my whole family. My mom's house is on fire, Pardo's ex-sister-in-law told an emergency dispatcher. We need someone immediately. My daughter's been shot in the face. Police and firefighters who first arrived on the scene believed Bruce had perished in the fire when in fact, he had somehow survived horrific burns and smoke inhalation and was en route to his brother's house, roughly 25 miles from Covina. It took almost 100 firefighters an hour and a half to get the inferno under control. A subsequent inspection of the interior yielded the charred remains of three victims, with the remains of five additional victims being discovered shortly afterward. The hunt for Bruce Pardo was on, with authorities desperate to locate him before he could kill again. But around 3.30 a.m., they received a call from a man who claimed to be Bruce's brother, and he had some shocking news for them. When police officers arrived at Bruce's brother's place, they found him dead from a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. Using plastic wrap and a girdle, police found $17,000 in cash strapped to Bruce's body. He was also in possession of a plane ticket to Canada that was scheduled to leave the day after the massacre. They also found what was described as a virtual bomb factory inside his home. Inside Bruce's car, police found roughly 300 rounds of ammunition, two computers, a map of Mexico, and a booby trap that was rigged up to a flare. An FBI ordnance disposal team attempted to disarm the device, but the attempt failed catastrophically, and the car exploded. Luckily, no one was hurt during the incident but it just showed how violent and determined Bruce had become in his efforts to take human life. In total, Bruce managed to kill nine of his ex-wife's family and friends, including the woman herself. The departed included Sylvia's parents, Joseph and Alicia Ortega, her sister Alicia, and her sister's son Michael. The other victims were believed to be two of Sylvia's brothers and both of their respective spouses. Astonishingly, the initial gunshot victim survived her injuries. The eight-year-old girl, 
as did another age 16 who was shot in the back. Their physical injuries healed quickly, but as for the emotional wounds, that may take much, much longer to mend. In the aftermath, when told of the killings, Bruce's friends struggled to believe what had taken place. Bruce was the nicest guy you could imagine, said Jan Tatana, the head usher at his church. Always a pleasure to talk to, always a big smile. Others described him as a kind and gentle man who was considered incapable of violence but speculated that his divorce, the loss of his job, and mounting debt simply pushed him over the edge. I can't believe I'm seeing my old boyfriend on TV and all the people he destroyed, added Carol Sanchez, who dated Bruce during their high school years. It's heartbreaking. He was a very easygoing person, a very friendly guy. I would never in my right mind think that he would ever do anything like that. And maybe that's exactly the point regarding people like Bruce. At one time, he was known to one and all as that gentle, church-going soul who couldn't hurt a fly. But something changed Bruce. In the middle of all that sadness and loss and pain and grief, Bruce just stopped being Bruce. Something buzzed up a nostril and into his skull, laying hateful little eggs that would grow and fester until all that was left was bile and malice. Bruce didn't die out on his brother's property when he took his own life. Bruce Pardo died when his soul ran out of stamina and sank slowly into the deep, dark void to drown in his grief forever. On Christmas Day of 2014, a 911 dispatch center in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania received a phone call from a 36-year-old man named Dustin Lee Klopp. Klopp proceeded to tell the dispatcher that he required police assistance at his home, apparently citing a domestic disturbance and, after being assured that officers were on their way, Klopp hung up the phone. A short time later, when police officers arrived at the Klopp family home, they were met with the sights of a derelict house. Domestic disturbance calls usually implied that a property was occupied, but in this case, there didn't appear to be anybody home. This prompted the officers to begin circling the home, searching for signs of anything amiss. That's how they ended up near a shed in the Klopp family's backyard, a shed that had the smell of death about it. Upon searching the shed, the officers found a bag containing the remains of a freshly slaughtered adult female, one that was soon determined to be Stephanie Kilhefner, the wife of Dustin Lee Klopp. But the question remained, if Stephanie was lying dead in the family tool shed, where was Dustin and their two daughters? The police rushed into action, terrified that there was a risk to the surviving family members. It was imperative that they located Dustin, at least to inform him that his children were missing. But just 30 minutes after the call Dustin placed at the 911 dispatch center, he walked into a Lancaster County State Police barracks and made a harrowing statement. My name is Dustin Lee Klopp, he told the officers at the front desk, and I murdered my wife. Homicide detectives then took Klopp into an interview room and began to take down his confession. According to Dustin, it was around 10 p.m. on Christmas Eve when an argument with his wife began to steadily escalate. The holidays can be a stressful time of year for people with less than stable lives, and certainly in the Klopp's case, alcohol compounded what had already been a tense atmosphere. Dustin said that Stephanie began to berate him, cataloging his failures while she subjected him to a thorough verbal flogging. Dustin told her to stop, but she refused, continuing to cudgel and humiliate him. And we all know that the trouble with the ones you love is they have the ability to hurt you the most. Stephanie's words cut deep, so deep that Dustin simply lost his mind and saw red. But no amount of emotional hurt can possibly excuse what he did next. Dustin said that, as Stephanie rose from her seat to physically confront him, he followed suit and threw a punch so hard that it knocked his wife unconscious. It isn't clear what went through Dustin's head in the moments that followed him striking his wife. He only ever talked about what he did and not why he did it. But what we do know is that Dustin obviously decided that Stephanie had to go. He had crossed the line, 
committed an unforgivable act, and it was one that Stephanie would ruin him for. She'd take the kids, she'd take the house, and she'd take half of every paycheck for as long as he continued to draw breath. And to Dustin, that was simply not an acceptable outcome. He went into the family kitchen, reached for the butcher's block, and took out the sharpest knife he could find. He said he waited for a while over his wife's unconscious body, watched all the possible outcomes of his actions playing out before his eyes, but in the end, he made up his mind. Dustin kneeled down, brought the blade of the knife up to his wife's throat, and then sliced open her jugular vein. Blood must have plumped from the open wound like a faucet with Stephanie's powerful heart muscles sending blood shooting up the arteries towards her neck and brain. Yet she didn't expire instantly. In fact, Stephanie Kill Hefner took an upsettingly long time to die, so much so that her husband opted for an even more violent solution. Dustin walked into the family's backyard and retrieved a large axe he'd been using to chop wood for a smoker. He then walked back into the family home, brought the axe up above his head, then used the sharpened blade to split his wife's head in two. After that, she was no longer breathing, and her fight for life was brought violently to an end. Dustin then spent the rest of the night dismembering his wife's corpse. All the while his sleeping children lay upstairs, blissfully unaware of the carnage that had unfolded below. By the time morning came, Dustin had only just finished cleaning up his dead wife's blood. He'd also bundled her severed limbs and torso into a bag, which he then took out to the tool shed in the backyard, but still, the scene wasn't quite purged of the scent of death. As a result, Dustin swiftly drove his children over to their grandparents' place, telling them that they were celebrating Christmas at their place that year. The grandparents found their appearance such a lovely surprise that they didn't question Dustin too much before he took off in his truck. Overcome with guilt, Dustin drove around for a little while and contemplated turning himself in. He briefly considered taking his own life, thinking himself unable to face the trials that would inevitably follow. His children would never have a normal Christmas again, not after their father had murdered their mother in a drunken rage. But in the end, Dustin simply drove over to the state police barracks and, with a heavy heart, confessed to the murder of his own wife. The guilt was something he could never seem to overcome, and in early 2015, while being held at a Lancaster County prison, Dustin hung himself in a cell. His attempt was soon interrupted by a prison guard, but it was too late. Dustin was declared clinically brain dead just a week later, and passed away after his life support was turned off. Crimes like this are prime examples of why restraint and de-escalation are so important. When Dustin lost his temper with his wife, he not only lost the moral high ground, he kicked off a chain of events that would end with the deaths of both himself and his wife. It's almost reminiscent of the game of chess. Good chess players think two or three steps ahead before moving a piece. They consider all possible outcomes of their actions, never making a move in haste. Maybe that's why such an ancient game is still so relevant today, in which case, maybe we should think a little more like chess players. If we did, maybe the world would be a better, brighter place. On a freezing New York evening, just three days before Christmas, the Harris family received the last visitor its members would ever see. One after one, Tony and Dolores Harris, their 15-year-old Shelby, and their 11-year-old Mark were tied up, shot, then doused with gasoline and set alight. Their horribly scorched and disfigured corpses were discovered the following morning after a neighbor of theirs complained to the fire department about a smoke alarm going off on their property. Police said that there was no sign that an intruder had forced entry into the house, leading them to believe that they had either snuck in through an open door or window, which was highly unlikely given the cold winter, or that the killer was someone they'd known and trusted. However, as state police captain Carl Shavers stated to the media, it's a tragedy. These were very outgoing people who would open the door to just about anyone. In the immediate aftermath, 
police struggled to discern a motive to the murders, and they soon enlisted the help of FBI agents in their quest for solid leads. A brown and tan van was discovered to have been taken from the family's garage, and it was recovered later in the parking lot of a mall nearby. Police then stated that they said that they wished to speak with a cyclist who was seen riding through the area shortly before nightfall on December 22nd, but no one came forward. As the Christmas wreaths and red ribbons still fluttered from the doorways of the gray two-story house, they were soon joined by yellow crime scene tape. The Harrises lived in Ellis Hallow, a quiet neighborhood set between forested hills just north of Ithaca in western New York State. The family had moved there in 1986 when Tony Harris was named sales director of Deanco, a Syracuse-based electronic equipment distributor. His wife Dottie was close with just about everyone in the neighborhood and organized bake sales and cookie exchanges. She was active in the PTA and the Ellis Hollow board and she opened a crafts and gift shop, the Grey Goose, in a barn next to the house. Neighbors said the crime rate was extremely low, with roughly one incident of theft or burglary being recorded every year. Tompkins County Sheriff Robert Howard mentioned that there hasn't been a murder in Ellis Hollow in a long, long time. And naturally, its residents were suitably horrified by such a brutal familicide. About the worst thing that happens here is a car accident in the winter, said Pat DeMaine, who lived two houses from the Harris residence. Ellis Hollow was the kind of place where people left their doors unlocked and neighbors watched each other's children. Yet after the Harris murders, they started to peer cautiously through their windows before answering the door. At the family's collective funeral... Loved ones and neighbors described them as active and well-liked members of the community. You can't think of anyone that would have a grudge against them, said Anne Parziale, a friend of Mrs. Harris. People can't understand how it could happen. This is a very wholesome, family-oriented community. Those things aren't supposed to happen here in this community, added Edgar Clemens, a retired school teacher who had lived on Ellis Hollow Road for 26 years. I don't think anybody around here slept Saturday night. I've opened the door to people whose cars have broken down. I don't think I'll do that anymore. Police quickly uncovered a suspect, an ex-con known as Michael Kinge, and set about tracking him down. Yet when they finally cornered him at his apartment complex, Kinge produced a shotgun, placed it under his chin, and threatened to take his own life. The cops held their fire, promising to bring in a trained negotiator in the hopes of de-escalating the situation but before this negotiator arrived, Kinge aimed the shotgun at police officers and fired. Thankfully, the shot sent lead fragments spraying harmlessly above their heads, and law enforcement's return fire was considerably more accurate. But before he fell, Kinge turned the shotgun on himself, racked a shell into the chamber, and fired. The Tompkins County Medical Examiner found that the shot Kinge fired in his attempt at taking his own life had merely grazed the left side of his face, and it was the police's small caliber handgun ammunition that had put him down. However, given the circumstances of Kinge firing a shot at them, his death was ruled a justifiable homicide. Obviously, Kinge was never put on trial for the murders, but him taking his life by cop was seen by many as a tantamount to an admission of guilt. This was later confirmed when a sawed-off rifle found in the suspect's apartment was positively identified as the weapon used to kill the Harris family. Kinge's mother was wrongfully convicted of being involved in the murders and, and it ended up being a major police scandal, but aside from this horrifying miscarriage of justice, the really disturbing thing is that the motive behind the killings was never determined. No one knows why a small-time crook like Michael Kinge just suddenly snapped and chose the most wonderful time of the year for one of the most heinous crimes in history. Born on the Italian island of Sardinia in 1895, little Giorgio Sodu emigrated to the United States at 13 years old. He arrived at Ellis Island during the summer of 1908 accompanied by one of his older brothers. But as soon as both boys had cleared customs, the older brother turned around and sailed right back to Sardinia, leaving poor little Giorgio all alone in New York City. 
It's not clear why this older brother didn't stay with him, or why little Giorgio was sent to America at such a young age. Giorgio didn't like to talk about Sardinia or the reasoning behind his daunting journey across the Atlantic. Giorgio eventually changed his name to George Sauter and found work on the railroads of Pennsylvania. He started off as a water boy but was eventually promoted to the position of driver in Smithers, West Virginia, saving his pay until he was able to start his own trucking company. George and his handful of employees hauled filled dirt to construction sites and later took to hauling the coal that West Virginia is famous for. It was while working in Appalachia that George met a girl named Jenny Cipriani, a fellow immigrant from Italy and, as it turned out, she had arrived in the United States around the same time George did. They began dating and married shortly afterward, settling in a two-story timber frame house two miles north of nearby Fayetteville. Over a ten-year period, Jenny and George would go on to have a jaw-dropping ten children, the first of which was born in 1923. With his prospering trucking business making a handsome profit, George was more than able to provide for such a large family. But the man was as outspoken as he was hard-working, and was particularly vocal regarding his hatred for Benito Mussolini, the brutally fascist dictator of Italy. This led to many an argument with other members of the local Italian-American community, and he was said to have almost come to blows with one or two of the pro-Mussolini camp. His passionate opposition was probably motivated by the fact that Joe, his second oldest son, had left home to fight in Europe in 1943. Eighteen months after Joe's departure, Mussolini was overthrown, tortured, and then executed by Italian freedom fighters. George welcomed the news with jubilance, and was said to have publicly celebrated the dictator's death among family and friends. Yet it seems that someone, somewhere, observed the commemorations with a vile contempt, and soon the Sauter family began to experience a series of sinister visitations. In October of 1945, George's older sons had also noticed a strange car parked along the main highway through town, its occupants watching the younger Sauter children as they returned from school. Then one day, there was a knock on the Sauter's front door. George answered the door to find an electrician on the doorstep. He didn't remember calling an electrician, but the man claimed to have been sent over on behalf of the local electrical company, with his task being to check the home's wiring. Confused but trusting, George welcomed the man to his home, who promptly began the inspection. By the time he worked his way around to the backyard, the electrician was telling George that the wiring in his house was faulty, so much so that it was a potential fire hazard. This confused George even more, as the entire home had been refurbished less than a year prior. But he took the man at his word, thanked him, then saw him out. George then called another electrician and asked him to come and take a look at the wiring. This new electrician confirmed his initial belief that there was nothing wrong with the wiring in his house and told George that the electrical company doesn't just send guys around to check the wiring of houses. Whoever the man was, he certainly hadn't been with the electrical company. But if he wasn't an electrician, who was he? A week or two after the fake electrician had showed up, the Sodders received another knock at the door. This time, the man introduced himself as a traveling life insurance salesman and offered George extremely low rates on a lucrative policy. When George jokingly asked what the catch was, the man assured him there wasn't one, then said something to the effect of, You never know. A guy who goes around making dirty remarks like you do, their home could just go up in smoke at any time. Then everything they've worked for, the nice house, the beautiful wife, the children, they're all going to be burned to cinders. It was all beginning to make sense. The visit from the fake electrician, the salesman's comments about a fire, it was a result of his opposition to European fascism. George told the man to get off of his property, warning him that any other solicited visits would be repulsed by force. The visits soon ceased after that and in the run-up to the holidays, things began to return to normal. Christmas of 1945 was much like any other in the Sauter household. It was expensive, it was hectic, but to Jenny and George, watching their children open their presents was pure, unrefined joy. The eldest of their daughters, Marion, had been working in a dime store in downtown Fayetteville and 
She surprised three of her younger sisters with new toys that she had bought for them as gifts. Around 10 p.m., the children were so excited that they asked their mother if they could stay up past their usual bedtime, and since it was the happiest day of the year, their mother agreed. The only condition was that they put the cows in and feed the chickens before going to bed. By 30 minutes past midnight, the whole family was asleep in their beds when, suddenly, their phone began to ring. Jenny Sauter woke up and walked downstairs to answer the call, but when she picked up, she didn't recognize the voice on the other end. It sounded like a young woman who was calling from a party, with loud voices and clinking glasses in the background. The woman addressed Jenny by a name she'd never heard of, then when Jenny told her she might have the wrong number, the woman laughed before hanging up the call. Confused but not alarmed, Jenny simply replaced the phone's handset and returned to bed. But that wasn't the last time she'd be woken up that night, because outside, in the cold December darkness, men were gathering, and they had evil on their minds. Just after 1am, Jenny was once again awakened by the sound of something hitting the roof of her house. She later said it sounded like a bang, then a rolling noise, but it wasn't enough to wake up any other family members. Around 30 minutes later, Jenny was still lying in bed, wide awake, when she began to smell smoke. When she investigated, she found George's office was in flames and hastily began to wake up the rest of her family so they could all evacuate. In the minutes that followed, both parents and four of their children, Marion, Sylvia, John, and George Jr., all escaped the house suffering from nothing but smoke inhalation. Once they were outside, George attempted to re-enter the house but discovered the stairs were on fire. It was then that he suffered through the horrific realization that his remaining six children were trapped in the rooms upstairs, soon to be engulfed by the raging inferno. He then rushed to the family phone, attempting to call 911 as his home burned, but the line was dead. He ran back outside, screaming for his daughter Marion to run to a neighbor's house so they could call the fire department. While this was occurring, a driver on the road nearby had also witnessed the blaze and had sprinted into a nearby tavern to call 911 yet they too found the phone line to be dead. An ominous pattern begins to emerge when we discover that Marion, upon arriving at the neighbor's house, heard them say something about the phone not working. In the end, it's believed the passing motorist was eventually able to reach the fire department from another phone in a tavern a few miles down the road. Clearly, someone had disconnected the phone lines not just to the Sauter household, but to the entire neighborhood. Upon learning that no one was able to contact emergency services, George Sauter flew into action. He ran into his backyard, where the family usually kept a long wooden ladder. But you guessed it. Someone had taken the time to remove it from the backyard and it was nowhere to be seen. Then, completely barefoot, George climbed a wall of his house, breaking an attic window in an attempt to climb inside. Yet in the process, George cut his arm so badly that he was in danger of bleeding to death and he was forced to retreat back down to the ground. Over the next 45 minutes, the six surviving Sodders had no choice but to watch their home being reduced to little more than a pile of cinders. They wailed and screamed as it did, assuming that the remaining children had perished in the fire. Due to the ongoing American contribution to World War II, the local fire department were painfully low on manpower. As a result, they failed to respond until around dawn, hours after the fire had started, and it was later discovered that the fire chief, a man named F.J. Morris, couldn't even drive the fire truck and had to wait until someone who could drive it was available. By the time they arrived, the firefighters could do little but sift through the ashes that remained in the Sauter's basement. Yet by 10 a.m., the fire chief had informed the surviving family members that they had been unable to find any bones meaning that either the fire had been hot enough to incinerate the remains completely, or they hadn't been in the house at all. There are two prevailing theories at work, the first being that the house fire did burn hot enough to incinerate the children. This is somewhat unlikely, since without the presence of plastics or accelerants, it's fairly difficult for a regular house fire to reach incineration level temperatures. The second side of this theory is that there was evidence of human remains, but the firefighters were simply too incompetent to find them. Yet the other theory is that someone entered the house before the fire was started, 
and kidnap five of the Sauter children. But who in the world would do such a thing and was their crime connected to the threats that George had received in the months before? After four days, when the fire department had ceased their investigation, George had the site bulldozed with the intention of converting it to a memorial garden for the lost children. The grief was unbearable, but George seemed to have made up in his mind that the fire was just a horrible accident. Yet the following day, the local coroner gave a statement which made George's skin crawl. Instead of blaming the fire on an arson attack, the coroner announced that the cause to be faulty wiring faulty wiring in a house that had been checked over twice within the previous year. Shortly after, when George sought out those that had advised the coroner on his official statement, he made a horrifying discovery. One of the men that had attested that the fire was an electrical fault was the same man that had been pretending to be a life insurance salesman in order to threaten George on his doorstep all those months before. There seemed an obvious conspiracy at work, yet despite his pleas, no one would listen to George's theories on his missing children. The official take was that they died in the fire, and death certificates for the five children were issued December 30th. The local Fayetteville newspaper then openly contradicted itself, stating all the bodies had been found, but then later in the same story reporting that only part of one body was recovered, almost as if it had been edited at the last minute, but not thoroughly enough to eliminate all references to the children being missing. In the years after the fire, the surviving members of the Sauter family attempted to rebuild their lives. But as they did so, and the clouds of grief withdrew, they began to question the authorities' official explanation of the fire's cause. For example, if it had been caused by an electrical problem, why had the family's Christmas lights remained on throughout the fire's early stages when the power should have gone out? And remember the ladder George rushed to use, the one he usually kept in the backyard? Well, it was eventually found almost a hundred feet away from the house at the bottom of an embankment, almost as if someone had deliberately removed it to hinder any attempt at rescue. Then, in the course of post-fire investigation, a telephone repairman discovered that the Sauter's phone line had in fact not been burned through in the fire. Rather, it had been cut by someone who had climbed up the 14-foot telephone pole before severing the wire by hand. The police had previously arrested a man who had been caught stealing from the Sauter property, and they confronted him regarding his potential involvement in the fire. The man admitted he had been in the area on the night of the blaze and had severed the phone line, believing it to be the home's power line. Yet he staunchly denied having anything to do with the fire, insisting he fled the area shortly after realizing he cut the wrong line. The police also managed to get in touch with the woman who'd made the wrong number call shortly before the Sauter home went up in flames. She told the police it had been nothing more than a mistake and had been intending to call a friend of hers, yet the woman had an Italian second name and despite the area having a large Italian-American community, a connection to the pro-Mussolini threats the family received cannot be ruled out. Then there was the matter of no bones being found. Jenny Sauter was very vocal in her belief that the children had been kidnapped, especially given that many of their household appliances had survived the fire almost completely intact. Given they were made of materials much less hardy than human bone, how did they survive the fire while the children were completely incinerated? Jenny also cited a similar incident which had occurred around the same period, when a freak house fire killed a family of seven. The skeletal remains of all seven family members were recovered from the smoldering ruins, and as a local crematorium employee later stated, it's possible for human bones to withstand temperatures of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, or 1,090 degrees Celsius, for periods up to two hours, far longer and hotter than the house fire could have been. In the spring of 1946, Jenny Sauter began turning the site of her burned and bulldozed home into a memorial garden for her departed children. It was a garden she would tend to for the rest of her life, but it didn't mean she'd given up on her missing children. After all, there was mounting evidence that what had occurred was a premeditated attack on her home, one that had been planned and executed by a shadowy cabal of fascist conspirators whose tendrils stretched among a terrifyingly wide network. It soon emerged that the driver of a bus, which had passed through Fayetteville late on Christmas night, 
said he had seen some people throwing balls of fire onto the roof of the house. This was corroborated a few months later as, once the snow had melted, young Sylvia Sauter found a small dark green rubber ball-like object in a brush near the ruins of their home. Could this have been the object which was thrown onto the Sauter's roof, perhaps after being wrapped in paper, doused in gasoline, and set aflame? The family's hopes were further renewed when several witnesses claimed to have seen the missing children after the home had collapsed in flames. One woman who had been watching the fire from the roadside said she had seen some of them peering out of the passenger car while the house was burning. Assuming they had been safely evacuated and were perhaps about to be taken to a hospital, she didn't think anything of it. Another woman who worked at a rest stop between Fayetteville and Charleston said she had served them breakfast the morning after the fire and noted that they had traveled with a strange man who drove a car with Florida license plates. These new revelations prompted the Sodders to fire a private investigator, eventually deciding on a man named C.C. Tinsley from the nearby town of Golly Bridge. Tinsley confirmed that the very same insurance salesman who had threatened them with a fire over George's anti-Mussolini sentiments had been on the coroner's jury that ruled the fire an accident. It had been no coincidence, no mistake. There was an obvious conspiracy at work. Tinsley also learned that despite the official account being that no remains had been found in the ashes, a scorched human heart had been found, which he later packed into a metal box and had buried in secret. The fire chief himself had apparently confessed this to a local minister, who broke confidentiality to confirm this to George Sauter in person. George then rushed to confront the fire chief, the same man that had claimed not to know how to drive his own fire truck, and was told that in reality, what had been buried was a fresh beef liver. He supposedly placed it there in the hope that the Sodders would eventually find it and would finally be satisfied that the missing children had indeed perished in the flames. This newest twist seems to have driven George to the very limits of his sanity. At one point, after seeing a picture of some young New York ballet dancers in a magazine, one of whom resembled one of his missing daughters, he drove all the way to the school where his repeated demands to see the girls were refused. George was eventually escorted from the premises by forceful but sympathetic police officers. George then contacted the Federal Bureau of Investigation, claiming that since the children were kidnapped, it was within their remit to investigate. J. Edgar Hoover himself responded to the letters stating that, Although I would like to be of service, the related matter appears to be of local character and does not come within the investigative jurisdiction of this bureau. If the local authorities requested the bureau's assistance, he would of course divert human resources to assist them. But the Fayetteville police and fire departments had declined to do so, relaying the questionable statement that they were capable of handling the investigation themselves. Then, in August of 1949, several small bone fragments were unearthed from the buried ruins of the Sauter family home, and after analysis, were determined to have been human vertebrae. A specialist later confirmed that they were pieces of lumbar vertebrae, yet quickly added that they were from a person between the ages of 16 to 22. This almost completely ruled out the possibility of the fragments belonging to one of the deceased Sauter children, as the oldest missing child was just 14 at the time of the fire. This expert also stated that there was no scorch marks on the bone, adding that it was very strange that these bones were the only ones found. These new findings attracted national media attention and the West Virginia legislature held two hearings on the case in 1950. However, authorities later told the Sodders that their case was hopeless and that seems to have been the point where all investigations, both private and official, ceased entirely. But still, the Sodders didn't give up hope of finding their missing children. They printed flyers, offered a $10,000 reward, and even put a billboard near the site of their incinerated home, begging people with information to come forward. George followed up leads personally, traveling to the areas where tips had come, for example, a woman from Missouri claimed little Martha was being held in a convent there, while a bar patron in Texas claimed to have overheard two other people making incriminating statements about a West Virginia fire that happened on Christmas Eve some years before. 
When George heard later that a relative of Jenny's in Florida had children that looked similar to his, the relative had to prove the children were his own before George was satisfied. The incident clearly had a horrendous effect on George Sauter's psyche, and he remained an angry, heartbroken, and deeply suspicious man for the rest of his life. The fates of the missing Sauter children remain a mystery to this very day, and despite the fact that several people claim to have met grown-up versions of the children, the case is unlikely to be solved anytime soon. And that makes it all the more frightening that there seems to have been a violent group of fascist sympathizers on America's East Coast during World War II, a group that was equipped, motivated, and hateful enough to execute a kidnapping so intricate and effective that they could make five innocent children disappear without a trace. Many years ago, among the vast frozen wastes of the Arctic Circle, a young reindeer was born with a rather frightening physical abnormality. Unlike the rest of its species, who are almost uniformly born with opaque brown noses, this reindeer was born with a bioluminescent mutation, meaning his nose emanated a sinister red light. Obviously, this freakish mutation gave away the herd's position to nocturnal predators, and as a result, the reindeer that eventually came to be known as Rudolph was violently shunned by its peers. He was referred to by slurs such as Red Nose and was subjected to an almost constant campaign of bullying and exclusion by the remainder of his herd. Then, during a period of particularly unseasonable Arctic weather, the lighting equipment of a prominent local logistical company was mysteriously sabotaged. Naturally, any transport company operating in the Arctic Circle would be equipped to deal with an environment in which darkness can last for 23 hours a day. So, who or what put them in a position where they were forced to turn to the unlikeliest of candidates during their hour of need? Nevertheless, it was none other than Rudolph that was approached by the company's management, who begged him to aid in the navigation of their cargo vessels in the lower northern and southern hemispheres. Rudolph agreed and... With his help, operations were able to continue despite the immediately thick fog which clung to the frozen tundra. The incident was nothing short of a public relations triumph for the previously despised reindeer, with even former critics stating that his efforts would, and I quote, go down in history. Yet the celebratory mood which followed seems to have allowed the perpetrator of one of the largest acts of sabotage in Arctic history to completely escape justice. Only a handful of suspects were ever considered, and each walked free after a brief period of questioning. Yet somehow, the one person with everything to gain from the sabotage was never brought in for questioning. It's awfully convenient that Rudolph, the one creature whose body had the ability to create its own natural light, would be in the position to bail out a company that some called too big to fail. And despite calls for him to be formally questioned regarding his whereabouts on Christmas Eve, Law enforcement has thus far neglected to act on them. Maybe Rudolph is just an unlikely but well-deserving hero, a reindeer who found himself in the right place at the right time. But maybe, for a reindeer who was nothing but shunned, humiliated, and tormented until his early adult life, making himself a hero is just the first phase of a terrible, bloody revenge. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured in the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories and big compilations and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, hashtag twerk for fry. <laughs>